Very good. Hello. <laughs> My name is Martin. Uh, Martin Montperus, if you want to pronounce it in French, I'm French. Uh, but I don't live in, 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 in France. Uh, I live in Sweden, in Stockholm. And today, it's a premiere, I arrived from Stockholm by train. So you know, thanks, uh, so there are two seas to, 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 to cross. The Baltic Sea first, uh, and the Channel second, but we have wonderful bridges, uh, tunnels, and so on, so which means you can really uh, go all the way from, from Stockholm, very up north, to, to London here. Wonderful sunny weather, it was wonderful sunny weather. Only, only with the train, so if you, if you like this, I would be happy to chat with you about, uh, about that later. Um, that's um, that's a snapshot of my web page. What I want to go um, is is first here because we have some time and uh, we do stuff. We saw the presentation of uh, Julia about Coxinen. So in my group, uh, what we are always doing is that so we are papers. I, I'm an academic. I'm, I'm a professor of software technology, but we are papers about software technology, uh, which means basically that we write a lot of software ourselves. So what we try to do is always to share to the world a pair of paper and code, or paper and data, or basically paper and GitHub repo. So if we write a paper, we have a GitHub repo, and we also try to do it the other way around. If we push something to a GitHub repo, we try to write a paper about it, such that our, our academic colleagues, such as uh, Michael, can, can cite them with a, with a regular line. And, um, and so I have here this link, which goes basically here. So a few pieces of code, um, just for you to know, if it raises a bell, I'd be happy to discuss about that. Um, we discussed about code transformation uh, so we do a library for analyzing and transforming Java source code. Uh, and I claim with, with uh, evidence that this is, this is the best library for analyzing and transforming uh, Java source code. It's called Spoon. Uh, we do a lot of things with code with uh, commi commit analysis, so which means we, we must have AST differencing, AST edit scripts. So give me two ASTs. I would, I, I would tell you the shortest edit script to go from the first one to the second one. And so we have Gumtree, which is a very powerful engine for computing AST diffs in all languages, in particular Java, but it also works for, for, for C, Python, Ruby, and so on. Uh, we have a, a machinery to go over past commits and uh, analyze them, so compute metrics, identify patterns, uh, was it a bug fix commit? Was it a, a refactoring commit? And so on. It's called coming, coming for analyzing commits. Today we'll be talking about something called uh, chaos engineering and er errors at runtime. Uh, so we'll be talking about triple agent in length. So that you know what it is. And chaos machine, it's close to triple agent. It's uh, it's it's a fault injection tool for for Java. Renzo, thank you very much for hosting us today. Uh, and Derek, thank you for the invitation. I, I already came once in this very room, in this very pap papers we love uh, meetup to talk about uh, automatic bug fixing. Uh, were, is there somebody who was already there last time? Nobody, it's a completely new crowd. Okay, so I talked about this idea of automatically fixing bugs. Uh, which means that you have, a, so you, you have a program with a bug, you give this program as input to a system, and the system outputs a patch for this bug. It's patch generation, automatic patch generation, automatic bug fixing, automatic software repair. So it's, uh, it's uh, the number one expertise of my group, and so we have a lots of, of, of tools. Uh, Repairnator, in particular, it's a program repair bot for continuous integration. So here, the idea is that you have a failing build, and instead of writing yourself the patch, you have a bot proposing a patch directly as pull request. 
So a bot fixes bugs for you. That's the vision of uh, automatic bug fixing, and this is what uh, Reponator does uh, for real in Java GitHub. So if you have like a GitHub with Travis CI in Java, you could receive some patches uh, automatically. Based on different techniques, uh, including, um, I don't want to say it, I'm sorry. I really don't want to say it, but it's kind of true to some extent. So our recent te the technique is called Sequencer. It uses sequence-to-sequence um, -sequence learning, which is basically Google Translate, but on code. So to some extent, this is what I don't want to say. So Renzo, please cut this. Uh, I don't want to, to be on YouTube with this, but this is AI for code. Uh, sorry, I really, I, I really, I really apologize. No. I really apologize, but still, so we, we, we use Google Translate -like techniques on code and it works. So basically, we really generate code with neural networks and, and, and it works for, for real. No, seriously, you can, you can look at the paper. Uh, it's papers we love, so sequence uh, So a lot of automatic paper tools. And finally, we do some testing tools. And I really want to mention them because some of them are mature enough for being used productively. Uh, as there are many, many tools coming, uh, coming out of academia. Uh, many of them are not publicly available. I was discussing with this, about this uh, with uh, Derek. Uh, some of them are publicly available, but they are so poorly documented, so poorly done that you, you can't do anything with them. And some of them are more mature. Um, here I would like to mention Descartes. Descartes, it analyzes Java code again, uh, and it finds code which is covered by the test suite, but which is actually not tested. Uh, what the trick here, uh, you take a method, a method is something serious in your, in your code base, so you take a method, you remove the method body completely, you know, nothing, not a single statement, and then you run the test suite again. And in many cases, uh, the whole test suite passes, even if you remove the full method body. So I, 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 I'm, I, I'm, I'm ready to bet with you that even in your code base, in your, in your best tested code base, you would say you have such methods. And if, if you want to find them, uh, go and look at Descartes. So that was like a short introduction. So again, we are doing always, we are pushing always a per repo paper. Repo, paper, repo, paper, repo, paper. And today, we are looking at triple agent. And papers we love, um, so I'm, there is this meta love, it's where you love paper we love. Uh, so I, 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 I love papers we love. And I, when, I say we, when you say papers we love, actually you don't, you don't love slides. Nobody, nobody loves slides, you love papers. So you want to look at papers, so what's this paper about? Uh, this is how it looks like, you know? Wonderful two column papers, but then we have really this look and feel of papers. And here is a title, it's, uh, it's a fat title. Triple agent, monitoring perturbation and failure of reviewsness for automated resilience improvement in Java applications. So it's like a Belgian beer. It's full of taste, uh, too much alcohol. <laughs> uh, so let's try to analyze what, well, so it's done, it's done by Long. Uh, Long is my PhD student, uh, Long Zong. Um, he will come in London in two days. There is a Chaos 42 conference on Thursday. Uh, do you go there? Nobody goes there? So if you, are, if you don't do anything on Thursday and you have a couple of uh, pounds to, to, to spend, just go to Chaos 42 because it's cool and because Long will be talking. Uh, so Long and myself. So let's look at the um, title again. So in Java applications, no, you've understood, all what we're doing is in Java because we have the expertise and the tooling, in particular, a wonderful source code analysis library called yeah. Spoon, yes. <laughs> so we have the expertise to do Java, so that's the easy part. So we do Java. What we do actually is the four, we did automated resilience Improvement. So resilience, what it means, basically it means uh, resilience to unhandled exceptions. 
We all know, regardless of the programming language we use, that uh, you can have a single exception crashing uh, your app. It's unhandled. So we'd like to, to do something against resilience, uh, against unhandled exceptions. And then, so the wonderful triple, so three, it's, uh, it's uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a prime number, so it's very good. So we have triple agent, monitoring, perturbation, and failure of business. And here, let's go and what I mean. So monitoring, it's very easy. Monitoring, it means, uh, it means understanding what's happening in production. Uh, we all know that we can do this with logs, log lines, log libraries, and so on. And, this is not the state of the art, but almost. Uh, but the thing is that, what are the challenges of monitoring? Uh, the challenges of monitoring is that you want to, to know um, what to monitor, when to monitor, how to monitor, and so on. Uh, so when with locks, basically, you decide upfront what to monitor. I want to have the variable A and B, when at this line, and uh, how it's fixed, basically. Then, and then I, I get, of course, I can configure log4j or my, my monitoring library, but it's, it's very primitive. So we may want something which is way more automated, So which means uh, the developer doesn't have to write a single monitoring line. Uh, adaptive, which means that if I need, uh, in production, if I need more monitoring, I just turn a knob and I get more data. If I need less because I, I, it's too much, then I have less data and so on. So there is a lot of work on, mo on monitoring and um, and I will come back to this later. Then, um, perturbation. So papers we love, we look at papers. Um, this is somehow what, what we mean. So this is a paper in, um, published in something very serious called uh, ACM Computing Surveys. So it's a journal which is uh, specialized in surveys. So it's only like super long papers with, uh, with um, hundreds of references, but it's really good for, for getting a, an overview of a field compared to a single paper. Uh, so I really recommend uh, to, to read the uh, surveys if you want to have an overview of a field. And this is a recent survey, um, two or three years, uh, by very important people in that area, uh, which talks about dependability and software fault injection. So here I, I mentioned resilience, I mentioned unaltered exceptions, uh, so resilience and dependability, it's more or less the same thing. You know, in academia, we love to have different words for different things, but uh, which are actually very close. And uh, fault injection here, uh, so something which is very hard to pronounce, but this is actually what we do. We do exception injection. So if you want to verify that your code uh, resists to a one specific kind of exception, you, at some point, you inject the exception. So it's a software fault injection. You inject the exception, and you see what happens. That's, that's the idea. So the idea of fault injection is very old. Um, you want to, in so you, for instance, you can see what happens if you change a single bit in, in your memory. Does it crash your application? Do, do, do you detect it, and so on? Uh, so there are many, many kinds of injection models or perturbation models. Um, so that's a paper we love. Now, so let's go back to the title again, which is here. So monitoring, it's fine. Everybody knows this. Perturbation, now you understand what I mean by perturbation. I mean fault injection. And then failure obliviousness. Does this ring a bell? Clearly not. So this is another paper. Oh, interesting, Christian, uh, so Christian Kadar is professor here in London at uh, Imperial and uh, he's the boss of Michael uh, today. Um, so Christian uh, is the second author of this paper, uh, enhancing server availability and security through failure oblivious computing. What is this paper about? It's also, again, uh, about uh, resisting to crashes and problems. And here they look at C code. 
And uh, you know, a very common crash in, in C code, it's, uh, it's a sec fault. So you try to write somewhere where you, you, you cannot write, or you try to read uh, somewhere where there is nothing to read. OK. Now let's be even more specific. You have an array of elements of a certain size. So you have 100 uh, elements in the array, and you try to write on the 200th index. Segmentation fault crash. You try to read on the 200th index, segmentation fault crash, or garbage and, and crash. Here they say, okay, yeah, but uh, oh, yes, there is a failure, but maybe we can be oblivious to it. Maybe if, if we want to write on the 200th element, what we can do is that we can simply skip the write operation and continue. If we want to read, we can, so writing is easy, we can skip. Reading, we must return a value. So we can return a default value, for instance. Or another crazy idea, you can return an element in the, the last element of the array. And, and so that's, that changes the semantics. That's uh, uh, a very optimistic view of software. Uh, and in this paper, they do experiments to show that it's reasonable. So they take, piece of, uh, they take code which crashes. They, so then it's done by automated code transformation, you know, those additional check for failure of usefulness. Uh, and then they, they look at the behavior of the software uh, without uh, those crashes, basically. So do the, do, does this improve availability? Does this corrupt the server state and so on? And so, and basically, so for instance, they take, um, let's look at the paper examples, they take implementation, okay. So they take um, a mailer, uh, so you, you may remember a mailer on Unix <laughs> called, called Pine, and there is an error and uh, it works and so on and so forth. Send mail, so send mail is even more important because it's, it's server-side software, so it's meant to be 100% available. You don't want to have a crash. So of course you can, you can put this in a, in a, in a while through loop, but it's better not to crash. And so in, in short, it, it works to a very large extent, and, uh, and, but it's still a non-conventional idea. So it was a non-conventional idea back in the time, in 2006, and it's still today a non-conventional idea, uh, both in academia and in industry. So now we have the context with perturb so monitoring, perturbation, monitoring, and failure of useness. Now what do we have all this together in triple agent? So what's that? So the first, uh, the main author of this work, uh, Long, is Chinese. And uh, so he knows the Chinese uh, pop culture, which I don't. In the Chinese pop culture, there is uh, Zhu Botong here, uh, somewhere on TV, on a series. And so Zhu Botong, what, is, what, is, what he does, so he's, a, he's a, a Kung Fu master. And to train, what he does is that he attacks with his right hand and he defends with his uh, left hand side. And then, you know, by doing this, he improves, he improves both his, his attacking skills and his, his defending skills. Then, you know, it's like automated improvement. Alone. So that's, um, that's remarkable. That's original. And so we do exactly the same thing for software. That's the whole point of triple agent. And now, now you get the point. Well, so we want to find those failure of use characteristics. So you take a piece of software, and in this piece of software, you add two things. You add three things, actually. But so basically, you add a way to perturb the software. So this is the attack. So to inject exceptions. So we throw exceptions everywhere. And we also catch the exceptions later. This is a defense. So this is a failure of usefulness part. So you give me a piece of software, a workload, 
And then there will be thousands of exceptions thrown, thousands of exceptions caught, and then analysis on the behavior to see where, 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 where the, how it works uh, in total. That's the whole idea of this paper. So we have here, uh, that's more precise. Uh, so we are in the context of Java. We have a Java virtual machine with an application running on the Java virtual machine. So far, so good. In, in the JVM, you have uh, a mechanism called agent, which is a way to, to plug into the JVM and to either collect data or even transform the code or change the behavior. Uh, so we have three agents. Triple agent, no, no, you get it, triple agent. So the monitoring agent, because we want to have more monitoring data than only the logs. The perturbation agent, so the perturbation agent, what it does is that it injects exceptions at many different places. I will come back to this later. And the failure of use agent. So play, the failure of use agent, it catches exceptions elsewhere because you don't want to just inject and catch it. So ideally, you want to inject and catch it like upper in the stack to see what happens. And of course, so you, and you have a controller which, uh, you know, want who attacks, who defends, and so on. So the controller tells the application what to monitor, when to inject exceptions, what to catch in a principle, in the, in the principled way. So you get some information here. Uh, and at the end, so because we want to, to, to know more about resilience, so the whole point is to give at some point to the developer a report about resilience and maybe even improved resilience. In this case, it means improved catch blocks, try catch blocks, additional try catch blocks in your application. So that's the output. So, so the main input of the method is arbitrary software in Java. And a workload, it's dynamic, it's a dynamic technique, so we need a workload. And the output of the technique, it's a list of new try-catch blocks to be put in your application. So the monitoring agent, what, what do we do? So we, we get some static information from the bytecode, the class names, the exception types, which exception are, are thrown by which methods, and so on. Uh, we get also some dynamic information, what's, what methods are executed, and so on. Um, the, the stack at any point in time. And also, we may collect some application-specific spe metrics. Now the perturbation agent, so we want to inject exceptions, so we do some bytecode instrumentation uh, at runtime uh, to be able to inject exceptions, and there is a listing after to show you this. And then, um, and this is a listing, very good. These are, yeah. Okay, so now, class two. Class two calls class one, M1, M1 is here. M1 calls class zero here. So when I call, uh, I, M, M, so I, the stack trace is here. So the stack is here, M0, M1, M2. Now, I, I know that this method, M0, can throw two types of exceptions, EA and EB. The question I ask, it's a typical fault injection question is, what happens? Okay, so this method throws this exception. So the developer is aware of this, and uh, so he, there must be some, some catch block somewhere to catch this exception. So what happens? So to ask this question, what happens if? What happens if? We add some code to be able to throw either uh, EA or EB. So we add some code to force throwing this exception. And, uh, and so then when we do this, the exception would naturally be caught in this catch block or in this catch block. So if we throw such an exception at runtime and it's, it's uh, caught by the, this catch block, then we can reason about the metrics we have, the monitoring metrics and the uh, oracles we have to see whether, so whether the behavior is, uh, is still acceptable or not, whether the application crashes or not. That's good. No. 
Now we do also this failure of virus transformation, which is here. So it's the same method as before. So we have the same code, and the blue, co the blue code here is the code that we inject. What the blue code? The blue code is a try catch block, which uh, catch all exceptions, and then we have an if else. So let's first look at the, and so the if is basically the way to control whether or not the exception is, is caught. So because if the if doesn't do anything, we restore the exception, which is semantically equivalent of not having a catch block. But here, if we say we, I, we want to, to silence this exception, then it's, we are simulating the fact of having, in the origin, uh, original method, try, catch, empty. Empty catch block, which, is, uh, which you would find in, uh, in, in many different ways. So there are many cases where you have an empty catch block. So here we have a, like, a way to, uh, at runtime, decide that this method actually is protected by an empty catch block or not. And we can control this at runtime. So we, have, we are able to instrument all methods and to see whether the methods can, 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 can have an empty catch block or not. That's, that's what we have. So basically, now when we run the workload, we, we, we throw some exceptions. We catch them or not. Uh, so we, we, this defines a, like a, what we call a perturbation search space. And when we, we can see whether the application runs normally, even if we throw and, and, uh, and catch an exception, whether it, it runs in a degradedly uh, degraded mode or whether it crashes. So now, so we have those points here where we inject exceptions. So let's make, so red points here. So here we inject exceptions. So we will classify those points. We say that those points here where we inject exceptions, they, are, they can be of three types. They can be fragile, which means that as soon as we inject an exception, it crushes the application. So, so this is a fragile point. It can be sensitive, which means that uh, if, we, if we inject only one exception, it's OK. If we inject more than one, it crashes or, or it uh, freezes the application. Or it can be immunized, which means that already with the current error handling code, we can inject as many exceptions as we want. The application embeds some retry technique, some alternative pass technique. Uh, to, to handle the exception. So all points are either fragile, sensitive, or immunized. So now a little bit of experimental data. Um, so we take an existing piece of Java software, which is called ttorrent. It's a, it's a BitTorrent client in Java. Uh, it's a, it's a Pretty, so it's a real, uh, real client. And we download a real torrent file from, from the internet. So basically, our workload, it's a real production environment. It's a BitTorrent community with all the seeders on the internet. And during the download, we perturb, we throw exceptions, uh, uh, and we catch exceptions. And the, uh, the advantage of this setup is that so it's a real workload. And second, we can verify the content of the downloaded file, which is a perfect oracle. So if it's bit per bit equivalent to the file we wanted to download, it means that no matter the, how, uh, how many exceptions we, 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 we injected, it was perfectly OK to, to throw and catch those exceptions. So we have a very strong oracle in this case. And here are the answers. So let's first look at the your, so I, I, this is your left, your left hand side here. So at the beginning, uh, so they are like a little bit less than 1,000 points, which are classified as either fragile, sensitive, and immunized. So most points are fragile. If we throw exception, it crashes the application. The application already uh, contains some resilience mechanisms. So 100 points are immunized at the beginning. And um, 
some of them are sensitive. Sensitive, we can throw once, but not more, otherwise we crash. Now we apply, so we do this exploration of all possible ways of throwing and catching exceptions. And we can see the difference. So with the new empty catch blocks, how it behaves. So here, this is, uh, so this sum, uh, 500 plus uh, 70 plus 13, it, it sums to 642. So lots of points were fragile and they are still fragile after, so we don't find any improvement. But some points, they were fragile, which means if we, if we inject a single exception, it crashes, uh, as soon as we inject an exception, it crashes, but then they become sensitive. They can, the application can handle one exception. And some of them become uh, immunized. Before it crashed completely, after we can throw as many exceptions as we want, the application works. And again, we have a stronger record. The BitTorrent file, the downloaded file is correct, it's fully correct. Uh, some points, so a lot of sensitive points be become immunized. Uh, so which means that we had partial resilience before and we have full resilience after. And uh, the immunized points remain immunized. Good point. Uh, that's more like a sanity check. So here it means that we propose to the developer, um, so there are, in this application, there are 200 empty cache blocks that could be added uh, and that would improve the resilience of the application. How you would do it uh, in practice, so either uh, so you would modify the code with a coccinelle-like tool to, to add them all. Uh, so you do some kind of code transformation. And since you know th those catch blocks are uh, synthesized, you, you may want to have some specific logging there to say, OK, the application was silenced here, but that was a, a, a catch block identified by triple agent. Maybe you want to have a look at it. Um, the overhead, the overhead is uh, quite small. Uh, so we have the, so this is a runtime overhead, downloading time because it's a bit around downloads the file. So before it's 20% with all the try catch blocks, it's 21%, so it's a little bit. We have a little bit of, um, uh, yeah, and so we have a little bit of binary size overhead with, uh, due to the code implementation, but it's, it's, it's rather small. Which means our dream here is that we would use this in production. So in production, we, we would throw and catch exceptions. Uh, so I'm almost done, Renzo. Uh, so as, as I said, we have everything on a repo. It's Royal Chaos uh, uh, at, uh, at KDH. I'll, um, yeah. And so to summarize this talk, so I talked about triple agent because in triple agent we have three agents. We have automated monitoring. We have automated fault injection. We have automated uh, try catch block injection uh, instrumentation, failure or reduceness. Everything together in the same JVM for a Java app. Thanks to this, so the, everything is based on code instrumentation in Java, and thanks to this, we can find ways to improve the resilience of an application. If you have any comments, idea, uh, don't hesitate to, to contact uh, uh, me. Uh, my email is martin.mompers at kth, at cs, csc.kth.se. Thank you very much for your attention. So, Martin, I asked Julia, well, I said to Julia that one of the reasons that Cosinel succeeded was her mailing list. Are you going to have a mailing list for, for this? So, we tend to use GitHub as a mailing list, usually. So, we accept, uh, we, we love to have issues which are just about questions. You just go to GitHub, open an issue, you can prefix it by question column, and just, and just, just, just yeah, like this. 
Any issues find by a uh, triple agent pointing at itself? Is it Java? Yes, it's Java. So <laughs> uh, that's interesting. So we haven't tried, but so when I when I came last time, I talked about Reponator, and so Reponator it uh, it analyzes uh, build failures, Travis CI build failures, and so we 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 save all the data in a, in a big database. And it's a lot of data, and so sometimes I, I recently I asked to a student, a visiting student to look at this data and to, to look at all those failing builds that the Reaper system had looked at, you know? And uh, he found that, that Reaper Nator has tried to repair itself. So there was a CI failure for Reaper Nator and Reaper Nator tried to find a patch for itself. And uh, it, was not, it wasn't a success. <coughs> yes, Julia. So when you say we could use this in production, what do you mean exactly? So this is the vision of chaos engineering. I mean, uh, so injecting exceptions in production. So under the real, so let's say, you, so you put this in a banking application, no, in a banking application, uh, and then you throw an exception. You don't wait for a natural exception to happen, you throw it on purpose because you want to learn what happens on the system if you have such an exception. So this is uh, the, the, the definition of chaos engineering. This is the last paper I wanted to show today. Uh, yes. Chaos engineering, uh, the idea is that you, you, you don't do fault injection offline, you do fault injection online. So the idea is that um you're going to, when I deposit some money, you're going to change the account to your account, and, well, that would be and you're going to make the code resilient so it's not going to crash, and so I'm not going to notice. No, in this case, in, in this case you, you, you wouldn't look at the crashes, you would look at whether uh, the system detects that the money was uh, put on the, uh, on, the, on the wrong account. So the property... Yeah, so my question is, who is you? I'm, I'm still not sure to understand the conditions in which it, this will be used. Is you the developers of the system? Is you, me, the user? Do no, I no, you're to... the developer, the owner of the okay. application. So the developer is going to be paying attention all the time for every person who deposits money that it goes into the account where it's supposed no. to go or something? No, 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 no. Oh. The, um, the developer states a property about the system. Such as, in this case, the property may be, if the money goes to a wrong account, it will be detected. This is a property. So the developer states a property. Then there is some, some infrastructure to perturb the system and verify whether the property holds or not. So we're relying on the, the developer to state the property. Well, it depends on the property, because if the, so if the property, if the absence of crash, it's an implicit property that you have. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, the concern when one hears about this uh, failure obliviousness is that uh, there are errors that are not crashes, and there are errors that are not particularly visible to anyone. So the system keeps running, and that's maybe a success, but uh, you can have some kind of security violation, some kind of so privilege that, that, escalation or something like that, which is not, it's more of a semantic concept rather than just yeah, a crash. Agree, so, so how is it going to be visible? So that depends on your application domain and your, mm -hmm. uh, and your oracles. So if you, um, so the, well, sorry, the short answer is that it depends on your application domain and your oracle. So for instance, in the BitTorrent domain, uh, if you, so we have the perfect oracle that the donated file is correct because that's thanks to this application domain. Uh, it's, that's, that's the answer. So there is no absolute answer whether it works or not. It depends on the strength of your oracle that you have, your correctness oracle. Okay. Uh, I have a question about like, what do you do in situations where you don't have those oracles? Like for example, I was thinking of the case where the, the Postgres thing where F-Sync silently failed. Uh, imagine a case where some of this is called gave you an error, you silently suppress it, the application would continue to work till the next time the entirety of the software or a database crash and you lose data. 
for example, I, I run large Cassandra clusters. It could be a case where, for example, you try to write to disk, you silently catch the error, you ignore it, the software would keep running till the next time the entire database crashes, and now you have like lost data. So it's a case where how do you come up with oracles in like very large scale softwares where you don't even know what's going to happen? So it's always very large. So this is again coming to chaos engineering. So this was invented by, by, by people at Netflix, engineers at Netflix. Uh, so uh, the, the, initial, the very initial uh, chaos engineering system is the chaos monkey. The chaos monkey, what it does, it shuts down randomly servers in production. Okay. So at Netflix, they have, they have thousands of servers, and the Chaos Monkey connects to, to, to AWS, in this case, and shuts down the server. And what the properties they check, they check that this doesn't have an impact on their core business metric, which is the number of streamed videos per minute. So they check the relation between shutting our servers and their core business metrics. And, and the thing of shutting down servers is that it's it simulates a wide range of problems that could happen for real, such as uh, an operating system problem, uh, such as uh, uh, an hardware uh, problem, and so on. So the point of chaos engineering is that you don't want the problems to naturally happen and then, and then to come into problem. You want to be sure that if, if, you, if you can't write to disk, that would be detected in a correct, uh, in a, in a correct manner. So you, you really verify the property in your system that you want to have. Before, before, before this happens for real and hurts you very, very uh, toughly. Yeah, but the question is more about how do you make sure that this did not cause a problem? Like, for example, what are the oracles you can put in? Now, the thing is, so it's, you have to put it in another way around. If you don't do chaos engineering, you, 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 don't know any, uh, you, you don't make sure at all that uh, resilience works because you don't exercise it. The only way to verify resilience is to force the execution of the resilience mechanism. Heron code is usually the most rotten code, the least tested one and the most rotten one. So the only way to, to, to have confidence, so you have no guarantees, but the only way to have confidence in your Heron link code is to exercise it in your production setup. Fair enough. This might be a longer conversation. So. Uh, that's a very, uh, I love that conversation, so. Save it for the pub. Yeah. Any other question? No? All right, thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. Andrew.